Good Day Economics students. So this will be lecture 18, I believe. And we were, we moved to macroeconomics, looking at the economics of the nation, the national economy. And a key idea I introduced at the end of the last lecture was gross domestic product, GDP, GDP. You'll often just hear people rattle it off like, you know, you're watching CNN or CNBC or something and, and the economics correspondent comes on, they say, well, GDP grows at a rate of 0.3% in this quarter and all that kind of thing. What is that? G gross domestic product, GDP, is the sum total of all final goods and services produced in a national economy in a set period of time, usually annually, every year. Final goods and services, sum total of all of them. Now that is an enormous number in the many trillions of dollars in the case of the United States. Now, <clears throat> I believe at the end of lecture 17, I, I left off the word final, and that was a mistake on my part, because final is important here. Take, for example, tires. Let's say Goodyear manufactures truck tires in their tire plant. Uh, and in the tire plant, they, they make these tires, they load them on trucks, and they send them off to the Ford factory, who then install those tires on F-150 pickup trucks that they sell to consumers. How do we count those tires? Do they get counted as manufactured at the Goodyear plant? And do they count it as part of the Ford F-150 pickup truck? No. You count final goods and services. These are things that are provided to their ultimate consumer. So the tires don't get double counted. We don't want one item like those tires to get counted in GDP twice. Goodyear and Ford both, both, both don't get to count them. Instead, it's the final provider to the consumer that does. Ford would count the value of the tires as included on the finished pickup truck. That's what the economist will look at. They will ignore the the intermediate good. That's what you call the tires before they go to the last consumer. So when they leave the Goodyear factory, they're intermediate goods. It's only when they leave the Ford retail location that they are uh, final goods to be counted in GDP. So that's important. Now, <clears throat> the uh, way you can count GDP can be done two ways. You can look at aggregate demand, or you can look at aggregate supply. Demand would be looking at the consumers. What do consumers consume in a national economy? So if you'll turn to page 446 in the second edition, there you'll see uh, table 19.1 and figure 19.3. That's a table and a pie chart that has the same info on it. And you'll look there, and it's talking in the uh, trillions of dollars. So again, I told you it's big. Uh, the total GDP of the United States in the year 2016 was 18.6 trillion, with a T, dollars. Trillion dollars. Now, it breaks it down into categories on the left-hand side. Consumption. This is what consumers like you and me purchase. Those are those final goods that go into the hands of consumers. $12.8 trillion a few years ago in the economy was purchases made by consumers like you and me. That is 68.8% of our economy. So one thing you should take away from this class is that consumers drive the economy. Over two-thirds of our economy is consumption by individual purchasers like you and me. The next category is investment. Now, this is business investing in their business. So this would be building buildings for factories or renting buildings for factories. Durable goods they purchase for their business, the pizza oven that the Domino's location buys, 
So when you're looking at investments here, they don't mean like stocks and bonds in the last couple of chapters we looked at. They mean business investing in things that will make their business go forward. So that's investment. Government, you'll see, is slightly bigger than, than business investment in 2016 in its contribution to the economy. This would not include entitlement payments like Social Security expenditures by the government, but it does include the salaries of employees, as well as things the government purchases. You know, those F-16s that they bought for the Air Force, um, but it also includes every paycheck that goes to every employee in the federal, state, and local government. So again, you can see there that government expenditure is 17.7% of the economy. Keep this in mind. That's a pretty good sized chunk. Anytime you hear people start talking about cutting federal spending, cutting state spending, cutting taxes, that's money that will not be available to be spent by the government. It's going to have to be made up somewhere else in the economy. I assume in consumer spending, where most of it would. If they cut the federal budget and consequently cut taxes, as often happens when they're trying to cut taxes, they want to cut the federal budget. What they're hoping is that money goes in the hands of consumers and that 68.8% of the economy consumer purchases is going to become an even bigger part of the economy. Or maybe they hope some of that will be invested by, by businesses and in their business. The last two categories on the demand side are exports. Remember, X means out of. So those are things that are manufactured in the United States and are sold outside the United States. Imports, the M there is like in, into, carried into the country. That would be stuff we buy from foreign countries. Now, GDP counts net exports. Net exports means exports after you remove imports. So if, hypothetically, the United States sold $3 trillion worth of goods to foreign countries, and we imported $2 trillion worth of goods from foreign countries, we would add $1 trillion to our GDP because we're sending out more than we're coming in by $1 trillion. I had to say, hypothetically, because, brothers and sisters, that has not happened since the early 1980s. We have not had a net uh, trade export in 40 years nearly. Uh, instead, the United States imports more than we export. Now, this is, leads to what's called a trade deficit. A trade deficit is where your country exports more than it imports. And therefore our net export number that we could add to uh, our GDP is negative. So on this chart, you can see that the uh, difference there, $2.2 trillion in exports from the United States to other countries uh, and $2.7 trillion imported from other countries, that is a negative number of 0 0.5 trillion or $500 billion trade deficit in 2016. Um, and that's going to reduce our national domestic, our gross domestic product by $500 billion. Now, once upon a time, back in the 70s, economists used to fret about this a lot. <clears throat> it does reduce, <clears throat> pardon me, it does reduce GDP to have a trade deficit. Um, until very, very recently, though, it was not considered a big deal. Donald Trump, in important ways, added this back to the national discourse. He, during his campaign, constantly was stressing trade deficits, which really, you know, when I was a student and I studied economics at, in my undergrad days back in the 80s, we were being told that, you know, maybe trade deficits are not that big a deal. And ever since then, that's been kind of the standard line of economists. They're not that big a deal. Uh, but Mr. Trump thinks they are. A lot of times his his economic policies harken more back to the 70s. So he thinks they are a big deal. Uh, why might it matter? Well, it does tell you one thing for sure. 
manufacturing in the United States is smaller than it is relative to what we buy from outside. So if you want to stimulate American manufacturing, you do want to take steps to reduce a trade deficit. If that's your goal, is to have American factories making the things we buy. Now, part of the reason why for decades people weren't worried too much about this is the goods we can import from overseas tend to be much cheaper for consumers to buy. <coughs> Pardon me, I guess I'm having an allergy attack, but much cheaper for, for people to buy. That's the reason why we started buying so many goods from China and South Asia and Southeast Asia is they're so much less expensive to purchase for American consumers. And this keeps inflation down. People's paychecks can be stretched farther. If you are hiring, if you're buying things from the American factory, well, for one thing, you know, at a bare minimum, they have to meet minimum wage standards in the United States. And um, in truth, most manufacturing jobs of any complexity at all pay well above minimum wage. Not uncommon uh, for auto workers in a GM plant to make 25, 30, even $40 an hour. Contrast that with prices in Chinese factories, Vietnamese factories, Bangladeshi factories, and they wouldn't pay their employees that for an entire day's work. So goods made in American plants are usually much more expensive than they could be made elsewhere. So that's why American manufacturing, we still have a fair amount of manufacturing in the United States. It tends to be high technology, complex things. You know, America still produces some of the best commercial jetliners on earth. Boeing is a major exporter to the world from the United States. Uh, you know, Apple st does believe it is possible to make money making iPads in Kentucky uh, because, you know, these high tech things, you can still be okay even if you're paying a good wage to the workers. Probably not going to be, you know, running off tons of t-shirts in the United States anytime soon though, okay? Um, but if you're worried about GDP, and we do look at GDP as a marker of the health of an economy, trade deficits reduce GDP. Keep that in mind. And there's your pie chart again. Just at a glance, you can see the light blue there. Uh, consumer spending is well over two-thirds of our economy. It drives to on the demand side. Now, the other way I can measure GDP is, is aggregate supply. These charts look at who's the final purchaser of these goods and services. Uh, and the services there, whatever you, you know, if you get paid as a government worker, those are services the government buys from you, your, your, your labor, okay? If it's not a physical thing you're selling the government, you're selling the government, you're your labor. And consumer spending, you know, that's not just physical items, guys, that's services. Your parents pay Gracewood Academy, who pays me. I am providing you the service of education, you see. Um, interestingly enough, from an economic and a legal point of view, you go into you know, Chick-fil-A and you buy a chicken sandwich, or nowadays I guess you're going through the drive through and buy a chicken sandwich. They consider those things, restaurant food is considered a service, not a good. Because they are, you know, that, that food will spoil in a matter of hours and it probably wouldn't be something you want to eat in half an hour if it gets cold, right? So that, because that, that those goods are so ephemeral, they pass away so quickly from usefulness, we value the work uh, of the workers in the restaurant economically, not the, not the burgers and chicken sandwiches and, and stuff they, they sell in this. Well, we're looking, even in fast food laborers, or, or restaurant workers in the finest restaurant in downtown Fort Worth would be services, not goods. Just to throw that tidbit in there, because those goods are too ephemeral. They, they last just moments, right? Um, in the next lecture, we'll go through and look at uh, the supply side of GDP. But just for the last moment, take a look on page 447, and you'll see two charts there. And it shows that as percentage of GDP... Uh, over the years of, cons of the various components of, of demand. And what you'll see there is over time, since the 1960s, and if you went back to just after World War II, you'd see the line continues even more. It's an upward trend. Consumer spending is a bigger and bigger part of, uh, of the uh, uh, 
portion of GDP uh, that, uh, of the economy. A government is slightly ticked down. Now, this may surprise you, but our government does actually provide, spend less as a portion of our total economy than it once did. Uh, investment can go up and down with a business cycle. Obviously, if companies are having a tough time, they don't, uh, they don't uh, uh, spend money on investment too much. So whenever you have like the Great Recession, you can see tunk, way down Great Recession of 2008. On the right-hand side, you'll see percentage GDP of imports and exports. And there you can see, like I said, it's in the early 1980s that we lost this battle. <laughs> um, and it's continued to grow. In the 90s, the gap really widened, and it's continued wide uh, ever since. And that's China more than any other thing. China in the late, in the mid 80s began to modernize its economy, introduce elements of capitalism, and uh, it became so inexpensive for companies to buy from China and ship it in big container ships to the United States. That's when Walmart and Target just blew the doors off the competition with these big box store and the big box stores. All of that buying stuff from overseas, cheap and shipping it in mass quantities, selling it uh, to, to consumers. So, uh, you know, unless you want to pay $15 for a t-shirt, it's hard to see how that gap's going to close a whole lot in the near future. Anyway, we'll continue with aggregate uh, supply next time.